Friends, I am Dr. Amdekar. In the last five videos, my colleagues discussed several issues related to renal problems. And you know, the kidneys are the gatekeepers of fluid and electrolytes. And having known this, the first topic Dr. Tushar Manir discussed was edema, which means an excessive accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space. Friends, we know that the fluid passes normally from intravascular space to interstitial space and then on to the intracellular phase. Whenever this balance is to be kept because of hydrostatic pressure on one side and the osmotic pressure exerted by the proteins on the other, that keeps this balance pretty well. But when there is an imbalance, which means either the hydrostatic pressure is increased as happens with retention of sodium and water, it happens in acute glomerulonephritis and a congestive cardiac failure or when the protein level goes down and an osmotic pressure goes down that there would be a leakage into the interstitial space as happens in hypoproteinemic conditions like protein energy malnutrition, a chronic liver disease and also nephrotic syndrome. Well friends, when we apply this knowledge, clinically we know that it could be a localized edema or a generalized edema. Localized edema is of course a local venous obstruction or a lymphatic obstruction and a generalized edema could be either a renal, a chronic liver disease, cardiac disease or it could be a nutritional problem or at times even a vascular problem like a capillary leak. How do you apply this simply clinically? Any acute onset edema is renal till proved otherwise. And the only other acute onset edema is an angioneurotic edema. Rest all edemas appear slowly, though nephrotic syndrome typically does have hypoproteinemia, but the acute onset is because of sodium retention. Further, a clinician can ask whether a patient in spite of generalized edema like anasarca is comfortable and happy, then you get a diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome. If he is a very acutely sick, then it's a capillary leak. And if he is a chronically sick, then of course it could be nutritional or it could be chronic liver disease with ascites or it could be also cardiac failure. It makes a clinical impression so simple. And of course, rarely in a Turner syndrome because of a lymphatic hypoplasia, you might have an edema even in a newborn, but that's rare anyway. The next important symptom is oliguria. And Dr. Mahesh Mahite said that oliguria is a marker of renal health. Friends, every patient that you see in clinical practice, do ask whether he's passing enough urine. This is important because the kidney gets almost 20% of cardiac output. So large amount of filtrate occurs through the glomerulus, but the tubules reabsorb most of it. That's how the urine is only of a limited amount. When this balance is upset, when there is a pre-renal cause, for example, there is a severe dehydration or a capillary leak or a cardiac failure, there is not enough of fluid reaching the glomerulus, so naturally there is an oliguria. Besides, the glomeruli themselves may not be functioning properly because of disease, like what happens in an acute glomerulonephritis. And then finally, it could be post-renal, where adequate urine is secreted, but it cannot be excreted out because of some obstruction to the collecting system and the excretory system. And that's how oliguria could be pre-renal, renal or post-renal and the rest of the symptoms accompany it are easy to differentiate between these clinically. Friends do always ask about the urine output in every patient. But the other extreme is polyuria and Dr. Khare discussed about polyuria and we know that when there is an excess of accumulated substance in the blood which needs to be flushed out along with water. Then there will be polyuria as happens in glucose going up, diabetes mellitus or a calcium going up in hypercalcemia which could be due to hyperparathyroidism and in that case there has to be a lot of flushing of water along with this substance 
and therefore there will be a polyuria. But of course polyuria could be a dysfunction of the renal tubules themselves. And finally, the renal tubules may not be able to function correctly because of the deficiency of an antidiuretic hormone and to that extent the cause of polyuria could be central or a renal but it also could be psychogenic which means there could be a compulsive drinking. Friends, polyuria is not easy to make out by history especially in an infant or a toddler who anyway passes urine very frequently and it's not easy to make out whether it's only a frequency or it's really also the large amount. And one good way to find out is if a patient passing adequate or large amount of urine is dehydrated, we know it's a polyuria. But at time, we do not know whether polyuria is because he is drinking a lot of water or he is drinking lot of water because he is having polyuria. A cause and effect is often not clear and polyuria is often a symptom that we clinicians forget to ask in details. And I think that's why this symptom is important not to miss. Thereafter, of course, Dr. Rajesh Chokani talked about high colored urine. And you know that normal urine is colorless, but when you have a deficient intake of water, urine is concentrated and starts getting a little colored. But high color is far more than that. And he discussed bilirubin as jaundice and he discussed many details about jaundice. Then it's of course blood. The blood flowing out of glomeruli is a cola colored urine. Whereas if it's a fresh blood, then it is in the collecting system. But if it's extremely dark red, it could be hemoglobinuria as well. It could be brown in porphyria. It could be pink if you have taken rifampicin. Typically you take rifampicin in the morning on empty stomach and the next urine passed after 4-6 hours would be pink and thereafter the urine become normal color. You know it's a drug induced thing. And occasionally when the urine is kept on standing it may turn black as happens in alcaptonuria. Having discussed these four important things, I think the last topic that Dr. Sridhar Ganpati discussed was something that often we find a bit of confusion to understand and that is a widening dysfunction. Friends, widening dysfunction may present with frequency of urine or sometimes incontinence, urgency, hesitancy and these symptoms are difficult to analyze for most of us as clinicians. But it is simple to understand that bladder does what the brain tells it to do which means when the bladder is distended, it sends a message via the spinal cord arc through pontine micturition center right up to the cerebral cortex and if you are on the road or if you are not at a proper place to urinate, the cortex sends a message to the bladder to hold back and the sphincter remains closed. Of course, there is a limit to what the bladder can accept this order and occasionally if there is no further order coming, the bladder may have no other option but to release urine and that's incontinence. This happens when there is something going wrong with this neurological arc. Besides that, there could be also a bladder muscle itself defective like a hyperactive bladder with a lot of frequency of urination or a hypoactive sometimes where the urine remains distended and if you do not get a proper urge, then you can have an incontinence as well. Well, friend, this is very simple to understand when you are talking about a widening dysfunction. And I thought that I would just make this video largely related to making our understanding simple for a clinical application. And I hope I have succeeded in partly doing so. I hope, friends, that you are happy with our steer channel and I wish you continue with us. You let others know about our channel and having finished this renal series, our next series will take care of the neurocardiac issues and Dr. Mahesh Mohite is going to talk on palpitation and uneasy experience. I hope you continue joining us on our video. 
थैंक यू वेरी मच